Good afternoon. My name is David Wortley. I'm the uh, Virtual Conferences Director of um, IORMA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on digital identity. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get underway. Um, to say a little bit about IORMA, uh, IORMA Consumer Commerce Centre is a, it's a neutral resource for businesses and government that recognise the need to understand and respond to the ways in which the 7.8 billion global consumers are changing in the products and services that they want and need and the ways in which they want to obtain these. And these changes are happening globally, driven by developments in society, in business and in technology. Now, this webinar is one of a series of thought leadership discussions held every other Thursday and topics are chosen from the IORMA's horizon scanning its surveys and its research. So I almost very pleased to be running this webinar jointly with Convergence Tech, who are a leading digital transformation company based in Toronto, Canada, um, and operating globally, working with clients and leveraging today's leading technologies along with industry specific expertise. Con Convergent enables innovation to take place so that organizations can become digital leaders. Now, you, as the audience, you can type in questions using the Q&A box. And we do ask you to do this. You're welcome to use chat as well. But if you reserve any questions uh, for the Q&A, uh, these will be dealt with by our panelists at the end. And we'll also be having um, uh, some polling questions and presentation slides throughout the presentation. Uh, so now um, I'm going to leave you for a little while and I'm going to hand over to Christine Elliott, um, who is going to be the moderator for this session. So Christine, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, um, David. So what interests me about this when is the last time that you used physical money? And if you do, how often do you do it? For me, it's, it's pre-pandemic since I put my hand to a purse. So is this then a, a black mirror moment in this increasingly digital world with identity and reputation digitized, analyzed, scored, a world where there's no digital forgetfulness and no forgiveness either. On the other hand, digital credentials could be really, really important for workforce mobility, and we have an increasingly mobile workforce. Or, for example, a campaign that was publicised just this morning seeking proof of age on pornography sites. How do we do that? Or on gambling sites come to that. At the same time, Let's get real. Is the technology actually working? The UK vaccine passport digital credentials won't be ready when travel starts to ease again. Thank heavens I don't have to answer all of those things. We've got two fantastic speakers and we're going to start our first poll. And as we do, I'll get them to introduce themselves. So, David, could we have poll number one? This is for you, our very welcome guests. Are you concerned about the number of digital identities you have and who has access to them? So while you're answering this, could I first just ask Eric to introduce himself and you know what you do and how this topic interests you and, and tell us about your experience? Okay, sure, so great to be here today. Um, I'm VP of Product Innovation with Convergence Tech. So that means I'm fairly close to sort of the technology development side of things and the solutions that we then deploy with our partners internationally. Um, with regards to that, we get to work with all kinds of interesting organizations and companies, uh, governments, uh, agencies like the United Nations Development Program, even uh, deploying our tech to some fairly interesting and remote places. Uh, one of the things we do a lot of work in is digital identity, specifically in and around tech development on sort of furthering some of these newer decentralized models of it. 
Uh, so very much digital identity, its deployment, its implications in society, uh, topic of interest for us. And, and previously, I'm coming from a background of about a decade and a half uh, leading enterprise and emerging tech projects with governments. So well aware of, uh, I guess, the challenges, but also accelerator factors that, that can be had by legislation and um, how that can kind of impact the deployment of new and innovative technologies. Right, thank you very much, Eric. And as uh, Sheldon might say in the Big Bang, something like Bazumba, 86% of you are concerned about the number of digital identities you have and who has access to them. So moving on from our first poem, David, may I get you to introduce yourself likewise, please? And we can close the poll down now, thanks. Thank you, Christine. Um, equally, I'm delighted to be here today to take part in this. In, in what is the sort of a central issue of technology over the next half decade in particular? So uh, I'm Chief Executive of Global Futures and Foresight. It's a foresight research firm, and we work with some of the biggest firms around the world. We work with the BBC, the British Army, um, every form of insurance company and bank, uh, and uh, have been invited by various governments to come and give um, some input and thoughts to what might be going on in the next five to ten years and we're sort of busier than ever helping people think about post pandemic if you like our attitudes to change so technology i was involved and i hate to say this but i actually did a sum while we were preparing for this I, i've been in it since 1974 so i started there 47 years ago and i watched technology just really get get smaller and, and smarter and more connected. And that's basically what we've done with it. And we've found, found more uses for it at every turn. And I have no reason to think it's going to change anytime soon. So this next five years is going to be beyond interesting. Uh, and it's going to provide such a great deal of opportunity to automate our lives and make life easier. But the biggest issue is identity, traceability, monitoring, uh, passporting, uh, being known. And as Drucker said in the 80s, you know, Permissive access to my information is what it's all about. So how do I how do I square the circle between wanting to be given things that are relevant to me, but not people not wanting to know too much about me? And that's where things like sovereign, sovereign identity, sovereign self-identification may have a role, where, where at the moment we centralize everything, maybe in the future it's peer-to-peer. -peer, but I'm sure Eric can can give us more wisdom on that as we go through this. But basically, I'm interested in you know, what does that landscape look like and how might it affect our lives? Terrific. Thanks very much, David and Eric. I'm going to start actually with a question that was sent me by Stephen Cohn, who I think is out there in the audience somewhere, which is basically, is it all too late? Have we totally lost control of digital identities? Is there anything that can be done? And may I just uh, put that to you first, Eric, before turning to David? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, once the data is out there, it can all sort of be correlated. So it, it's very hard to kind of clean up the past once the data has been released, but I don't think it's too late to start looking at what we can do moving forward to kind of change some of these patterns. Um, it's, it's definitely on the back of some of these new sort of concepts and new technologies that we can kind of leverage that are a bit more privacy preserving and sort of human centric, but I guess the flip side of that is it also puts a lot of reliability on the people who, who kind of control their own information with some of these technologies like identity wallets and the like. It, it puts a lot of onus on the individual to protect their own privacy and identity. And I think there's definitely an education uh, concept there that kind of needs to move through society before these kind of tech uh, advancements really kind of have an impact. So could I just sort of uh, probe you a bit more on that then? And perhaps you could just explain to us how these things actually do work and how they could work and are there any uh, are there any standards at all or is it just the new wild west um i would say there's standards in progress uh, there's a lot of good work coming out of um World Wide web consortium for instance uh, diff is another one about how to sort of unify on decentralized identity and these things called verifiable credentials um, that kind of being sort of a tech standard that gives you the instruction of what the data package looks like and how to evaluate it, which is a pretty important thing from a tech perspective. Uh, in that sense, I mean, with new and nascent technologies, it's always easier said than done. There's a lot of potential for this in the future to sort of um, work pretty well in a standardized fashion. 
right now there are kind of segmentations in terms of uh, different approaches and, and how these things are actually sort of deployed and rolled out to society. So a bit of a wild west situation, but we're all kind of heading in the same direction, hopefully as an industry to kind of change uh, some of what identity looks like on the internet moving forward. And so how do you think in, in the ideal world that we don't live in, how should it actually, how should it work? How could it work to put more control back in individuals' hands? Um, I think there's a lot of potential exactly with this whole idea of a, a digital identity wallet. I mean, it's it's one of those things where probably even about five years ago, 10 years ago, it would have felt a bit weird, but just how pervasive cell phones are in everyone's lives these days, it's not unreasonable to think as we go increasingly digital, as we move cashless, uh, to start holding legitimate digital versions of your documents like driver's licenses, birth certificates and the like on these sort of personal devices and phones. Um, very much they're with us all the time anyway. We, to some extent, safeguard them. Uh, it as a vehicle of communicating information becomes very convenient and you can do it kind of securely and privately as a result as well. So I think it's going to kind of head more towards a model of replicating how identity works in the real world on, on our sort of digital devices in that sense. Hey, thanks, Eric. And um, there's a really juicy question come in uh, on the Q&A, which I'd encourage everyone to use. So I'm going to go to that in a minute. But first of all, David, you're, you're very, uh, you know, tech relaxed. Have you got a digital wallet? Yeah, I have. And I'm, 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 I'm very keen on digital everything, quite frankly, because it may, makes life a lot easier. Basically, my character, I've lost every bit of paper I've ever had, but I've always managed to, to, to resource it using digital. So there's, there's a whole new aspect to, um, to how you run your life. But really what I think is, and my experience is this, that we always um, allow the innovation to run ahead of standards. So standards clear up the mess afterwards. If you think about the insurance industry, you know, it, it's born of being able to share information about what's happened, what might happen and what's happened. And yet only recently through a court in 20 years work, have they agreed standards to move information between each, each other. And that's utterly overtaken by the IoT and everything else that's going on around it and sensors to make it utterly irrelevant because there's, that is a wild west land of, of data standards coming out of the programmer's head. So it's whatever the coder thinks is broadly acceptable. So you can expect in, in let's say five years because things are speeding up, we will have a massive clear up exercise to try and normalize to some extent how we share data. But at the moment, people are running ahead in every direction, which is terrific. There's nothing wrong with innovation, but we need to accept that it's going to be wild west. But I think Eric hit the nail on the head when he said it's an education issue. We've got a bunch of people who think it's great and cool to share every aspect of their lives. Well, it probably is until it isn't. And, and that's the issue, is that at some time it might matter. But to me, the issue of identity is, is multiple identities. I want to be me when I cross a border or I go to a bank and transact money, but I don't want to be me when I collect you know, club points at my supermarket. You don't need to know who I am, and I don't want you to put the two together. So actually, I think the world's going to get a lot messier in terms of multiple identities, traceability, and all these other things. So there's a great conversation to be had. Excellent. Well, we look forward to that in five years' time, sending in the sheriffs. Meanwhile, um, here's a question. The panel um, you know, is asked for its opinion on Google's federated learning of cohorts algorithm for incorporation in the Chrome browser. Eric, any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm, I'm actually not too well versed on the details of, of, of that one, unfortunately, in terms of some of the work behind it. Uh, I will know, however, Google is starting, partially driven by regulation, to explore some things with privacy sandboxes and the like um, that are a bit more progressive, let's say, um, but it's always hard to say the intentions and motives behind big companies like this, which make a lot of money off of their data aggregation. They, they certainly they certainly do. And I think on that theme, so um, David, I mean, should we stop using certain providers because of their attitude to privacy? At some point, maybe if you, you feel you have a choice. At the moment now, when you take on an app, I mean, everyone says yes to, have you read the terms and conditions? And then uses the app because they want to have the functionality, but no one's read the app you know, ever. So we're all, we all quite happily lie about it. And then we're held accountable to the terms that they happen to have put in there. But, you know, that, that can't exist. When we get as smart as the machines, 
So when my AI meets their AI, I maybe will find ways of getting personal choice. I may be having terms actually adapted to me and I may lose some functionality. Right now it's either on or off. It's binary. You either use my app or you turn me off. And that's that's a world that can't that can't cohabit forever. So what I'm hearing is obviously we, we know customers have more than one digital identity. How does the service provider know which identity is relevant? And back to Eric for starting on that, please. Yeah, I think um, that really kind of breaks it down to this whole concept of identity and trust frameworks and the like. And, and that's where it's grounded in how identity works today. And it's on the back of credentials. Um, I say something about myself. This is my name, this is my address, whatever it is. Uh, it's up to the person accepting that information to, to trust me or not. So right now, we then traditionally do something like put forward a government identity. People trust the government. If my identity card backs up what I say, yeah, they have pretty good assurance that I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. So in that sense, it's down to the individual who is accepting the information, the service provider, to say, yeah, I trust the assertion because you backed it up with this kind of claim. Um, very much, I think that's how this whole thing ends up sort of scaling. It's a bit messy from a technical perspective, but when you're making a claim about yourself and you provide some backing proof to back up that claim, it's really down to the individual service provider to have their own policies on, well, do I trust this information or not? And that's usually who, who's asserted to this claim or who signed off on this claim, which is exactly some of the discussion going on right now. When you look at things like identity wallets for COVID passports, um, it's all well and good that the tech can solve things like this is authentic, it came from this government, it's accurate, it hasn't been tampered with, but then it opens that question of, okay, well, what I'm looking at is a legitimate claim or assertion. It's issued from this government. Do I trust that government and their healthcare system and how they administered a vaccine, how they did a test, whatever it might be. Uh, so it is really down to the individual uh, as involved as it works with offline sort of identity when I hand you an identity card to kind of look at it and check and make sure that they understand what they're looking at. And it's up to them to say, do I trust this or not? So it's all really based on reputation, I think, in that sense. Right, right. Well, just talking of that, and I'm going to pitch this one at David. David, there's abundant fake news out there. What about fake IDs? Are we never going to know who somebody is anymore? Are we really going to have to spend so much time thinking about, do I trust you? Do I know you? Are you who you say you are? Well, interestingly enough, um, Eric's just covered that ground in terms of who's issued the credential. It, it leads you to the trustability of what you're looking at, but we know things can be replicated, stolen, repeated. So. I'd say right now we're in, we're in a, a very interesting situation where we, we sort of trust things and because we trust them, they're worth faking. So we need to get beyond that stage where we motivate the, 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 um, uh, the folk who are creating these things to um, not produce or, or find it impossible to produce those credentials. And that needs a lot of technical support to do that. But what I would like to do is just slightly turn that question around is what you can find out about me. It's what I make available for you to find. So I, I think we'll, no, I don't think, I hope, and I've watched and I've hoped closely that it's actually gonna be a permissive world where I own my data, I own the control of my data. And I am who I am in the most clear way, but I choose to make elements of myself available to different providers. And I don't do that on a manual basis because that's impossible. But from a technological point of view, from different forms of AI, I can, I can allow and enable those that meet my preferences and my standards to engage with me. And that's when life and brand and reputation is as important on the other side of the fence to get me to even be available to them. So that's what I think the real game in town is. So my digital ID and credentials become part of ESG or other good ESG in the future? It's not at the moment. Well, it could be. I mean, if that's what you hold to be tr be valuable, then that would inform the decisions about who gets access to you and what element of access. Some things don't matter. You know, I'm not going to say what it is because somebody else might be in that world, but some things don't matter much, in which case your credentials may not come into play. But other things might matter a huge amount 
to you and therefore you really want a deep search on that provider to qualify to come to you when there's multiple choices so if i've got a choice of four suppliers maybe only two ever get to me and maybe i've told my ai engine to make a choice for me in which case i only ever see one and maybe i've even automated it so they do the business for me so th that world is a very different world and it puts all the onus as far as i'm concerned on the once we own our data and can control it on the other side of the fence and very much esg could be a a major player and presumably monetize that data as well but before we come back to those intriguing subjects i'm just going to ask eric i know you've got a few thoughts that you'd like to share with us so could we see those please and then we'll go on to a, another poll and plenty of questions coming in so uh let's have more Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, share my screen and go through a few slides here to kind of just capture a little bit about digital identity as, as a bit of a primer for sort of the discussion that follows, uh, kind of talking about where we came from, how we got here, which can kind of explain some of these broader ideas that we're now kind of circling around with user-owned identity. Um, so really, just to start with, open question on what is a digital identity? Uh, that's really just an identifier that when it's tied to an authentication method can bind your physical self to your digital self. Usually you need to do that again, so you can make some kind of claim or assertion about something. Uh, in the digital sense, it's often, I own this social media profile, therefore I can edit it. Uh, I'm authorized to move money between these two bank accounts. Uh, I have been entitled to see this information. And, and that's really where this is all coming from is that identity, digital identity really started as an engineering problem. Uh, it wasn't designed as an identity problem, but an engineering problem. Because as you put in databases and online systems, everyone who operates those has, has the same problems about data visibility. You need to know who's accessing the system and what they can access. So you can kind of control that. And that's kind of how we ended up with usernames and passwords. Uh, username is an identifier. A password is an authentication method. It's a shared secret known only to you uh, that shows that you control that identifier. Uh, and really the rest is history. And now we all have to remember long cryptic strings of text and numbers, which is a very unhuman thing, I would say, but better or worse, that's kind of how this stuff rolled out. Uh, the thing is anyone operating an online system uh, has these same sort of problems around data visibility. So as a result, as our world moves online and we start using more and more services, all of these digital services become identity providers by default. Even though that's not their business, that's not their expertise, they've just become identity providers because more and more of our digital data is online. So it's a very fragmented landscape where your digital identity is split across hundreds of entities on the web and in society, and you don't really have control over any of them right now, which is not too dissimilar to how identity works right now in the real world either. If you look at physical tokens like ID cards, um, your library and your gym will give you ID or membership cards, your city, state and federal governments, same sort of thing. They all issue identities. They all have their own sets and systems in and around this. Um, that for all intents and purposes works, but it's hard in a digital sense to reconcile all of that data, which is why this is the tempting pattern of a shared single identifier being kind of one of the solutions to this. Um, you see this a lot in sort of the one ID programs, governments and public services have previously gravitated towards this. And it makes sense, right? You've got data silos. You all use the same identifier. You have a way to reconcile the information and know you're talking about the same person, which is, again, an engineering solution, not an identity solution. But it's how we query data. It's how we sort and organize data. So you can see why it happened. But it's not a good pattern for identity. Single identifiers um, violate privacy because they're very correlatable. They're also a huge breach risk because as soon as you lose control over that number, that identity, um, yeah, people, people can start using it on your behalf and sort of applying for credit cards, uh, stealing your identity, getting other sort of documents. So, so it's really something that's dangerous because then the individual has to protect it. And not only the individual, but the companies who collect any personal information as well, they have to protect it. So I'm from Canada. The closest thing we have to a citizen identifier in that sense is our social insurance number. Just nine simple digits. Uh, and those nine digits are critical for things like filing taxes, applying for jobs, applying for credit. Uh, and if you lose control over those nine digits, 
your identity ends up being compromised. Um, people can, again, impersonate you, get other identity documents, sign up for credit cards and those kind of things. Uh, so it really puts significant liability on the companies who then end up holding this personal information. Uh, an example is Equifax. They're a big uh, credit rating agency in North America. This was back in 2017. They had a massive data breach, lost millions of records, and as a result, got fined hundreds of millions of dollars for this, exactly because they're leaking things like social security numbers and SIN numbers and the like. Um, so really, it highlights the liability companies have when they start holding on to this identity information and holding on to this personal information and why you really need to kind of take it seriously. And when you break it down, identity doesn't need to be this way because we're, we're not a number. We're not even really a name. Identity, when you think about it, is just a collection of claims that you make about yourself. And this can kind of be broken down into a model of self and then who-ness and what-ness, which is kind of how you describe yourself. So self, you can think of as your physical self, right? Your identity in the real world is the information you communicate. It might be different to your employer, to the government, to your friends, to a stranger. It all depends on context. But you communicate that through who and what. Who is your identifiers? That ties back to yourself. So that's things like your name, address, biometrics, relationships. That kind of gets used for authentication, to, to prove an attachment to yourself. Uh, what? is the piece that really matters though. And that's the claims you're making. I'm a registered nurse, I'm a licensed driver, I'm a citizen of this country. It's, it's what, it's those claims that are the important part about identity. And that's why society relies on credentials to create trust. That's why when I say something, I, I live at this address, if I back it up with an identity card, kind of as we were speaking to earlier, you trust it because you trust the government. And, and that's how these trust networks work because we can't trust everybody we can't take everyone's claims at face value. You need people to sort of endorse these things through licenses, IDs, and permits to really be able to back up some of your claims of what you're saying. That's all traditionally been anchored in paper documents and plastic cards for historical reasons. Um, digital has traditionally been slow here because it's kind of dangerous. Digital can be very easy to fake. Uh, images in Photoshop, easily doctored. Fake IDs can kind of be created very easily if we're talking digital. Uh, and the amount of people who have moved to doing things like accepting photographs or scans of licenses or permits for their online services is kind of scary. Because when you do that, um, one, you collect way more information than you need to generally and are now accountable for safeguarding and protecting that information. And two, taking a photo of these documents completely subverts all of the tamper proofness, all of the security provisions, everything in the document. So it, it's pretty scary that people do this, but it's understandable that people do this because I mean, our world is digital and it's very convenient to do this, but proceed with caution there. Now, fortunately there are these new and evolving tools uh, to sort of help with digital identity. And that's where it breaks down is these two things. The first, we've kind of talked about this a little bit is this idea of digital identity wallets and verifiable credentials. So that concept that's behind all this user-owned data and self-sovereign identity pieces and stuff like that, it's really about storing virtual credentials on your device, could be your phone. Um, point is it's stored on your device and not elsewhere in like a centralized database. And that's kind of the difference of this model because it gives you the agency to present that information very much like a plastic identity card um, that you can show to someone with your consent and, and communicate the information. So it kind of puts the user at the center of it all. Uh, it's very privacy protecting in that sense because this is also based on cryptographic keys and public key cryptography. So it's not identifiers, it's not numbers, um, it's in signing processes and digital signing processes that you can actually prove these things are authentic and valid and were issued by a trusted source. Um, and the advantage there is the tech takes care of this part Every relationship you have, be it someone validating or someone issuing, uh, it can be different. It can be a different set of keys. So all of this can't be correlated in terms of where you use your identity unless the person chooses to disclose it. So it's very empowering from that perspective. Um, that's on the claims front in terms of making the claims piece better and moving into a better version of digital. The other piece is on the authentication front. And that's really how biometrics have just been supercharged by AI these days. Um, biometrics are a very strong authentication mechanism. They're pretty hard to fake in, in a lot of cases in that sense. Uh, they can integrate seamlessly into the real worlds when you start thinking about things like passive usage of biometrics. You can look at 
photos of crowds or things like that and analyze them after the facts to try and pull some identity information from them. So uh, scary in terms of how effective it is. And we're all walking around with phones that have all kinds of sensors in them now too. They do facial scanning and they can scan your fingerprints. Um, the gyroscopes inside of them is, is sort of another topic that came up recently in terms of uh, just because of the uniqueness of your gait when you're kind of walking around, all those sort of like tilt sensors in your phone can really kind of create that data map or pattern uh, in the same way that it can detect if you're running or walking or cycling uh, and kind of present that to you in an app. All of that information, if you used it for identity profiling, looks very different when you move it between individuals. So there's all kinds of ways that you can use that information, information collected and generated passively to sort of uh, make new authentication mechanisms. But similarly, with all of this stuff, I mean, we have to be careful with these new technologies. There's always sort of a dark side to them, uh, or at least considerations that you need to think through. One on the digital identity wallet front, um, it reduces breach risk because it puts the identity information on a person's phone instead of in a central database, but that puts a lot of responsibility on the individuals then. So there's this social change that needs to happen on, hey, my birth certificate is sitting on my phone. Uh, I need to protect it as if it was my real birth certificate, for instance. And that's not always there yet. You lose your wallet, you'll, you'll call uh, your credit card company, you cancel all your cards, you'll uh, go get a new identity from, from your government, replace those cards. Not many people have that same concept of I've lost control of my phone. I now need to wipe the data or lock the phone or get rid of it because now it contains important information about me. So that's that education and that socialization aspect of uh, your relationship with this device, if it's holding real credentials, it needs to be a lot more serious. Um, also, it breaks correlation with regards to the whole idea of protecting privacy. Uh, benefit there for the individual, downside in terms of a lot of our predictive analytics and a lot of our good customer experiences are done by data analysis and correlation. So it makes all that a little more, more challenging and, and creates a problem for industry then to overcome. It also opens that debate on tech access, where if you're trying to put something on a phone, um, how fair is it to require access to a phone to gain access to public services or other sort of rights? Uh, so those angles to consider there too. And then biometrics, I mean, very controversial because they work so scarily well. Um, for all those same strengths are weaknesses, because if they're done uh, in a bad way with bad intent, it's very easy for a surveillance state to come up, for social credit scores to come up. Uh, and also, I think one of the biggest problems with biometrics is it's not a good technology for consent because it's so easy. So consenting to biometrics before they happen is, is a very hard thing to control. So that being said, I mean, uh, there's increasing importance on our digital identity in our digital worlds as we move more and more online, as we breach what's going on with IoT and smart cities, this stuff is just going to become more and more important. And um, this is really to say, with what comes next, we really do have to put individuals at the center to help guide where we go from here. With that, um, yeah, I'll, I'll open it back up to sort of the discussion. Thank you, Eric. Well, deep breath, everybody there, because that, uh, that was very thought provoking. Just before I bring in some questions, I'd like to move to our second poll, really, which is about your personal attitudes. Do you support the introduction of vaccine passports for international travel? So, David, if we could have poll number two, that would be great, please. And I'm hoping that will pop up. Excellent. And while that is uh, there, I'm going to bowl a question at David, please. Um, and David Smith, that is. And just say, uh, David, where are the politics? Where are the geopolitical trends in all of this, please? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they're at very different stages in different parts of the world and different attitudes to privacy and, and community. So you have to ask the question, you know, what culturally are our attitudes to self versus society? and our governmental's um, attitude to control and monitoring. So I would say from a political standpoint, depending what part of the world or what individual regime you come from, there's an entirely different attitude or motivation to want to identify you. And therefore, I'm 100% supporter of what Eric said, that self-sovereign 
identification, however we store it and however we, we make it work, it has to be in the individual's hands. As soon as you let the state get hold of it, is it let's just put it another way. Every time a law is passed, I've noticed over the last 45 odd years, is it gets used in ways that were unintended later on. So even with the best intention in the world, as we legislate for this, other uses will be found which will cause a problem. So we need to be able to give every individual the right to protect their data in some fashion, therefore through their identity. But what's really interesting is that, you know, we, we've had that to some degree for a long time already. You know, organizations have worked out that we're more interested, if we're going to do business with them, on getting our address right or my details right. Therefore, give me the opportunity to update my own details instead of you endlessly getting them wrong because you, you've mistyped them in and you've got no, no way of checking it. So actually, we sort of get it, the idea that the individual is probably best positioned to know how to share their data and to be who they are. But I think the real subtlety, the government, I mean, you asked me a question about governance. Basically, it's, it's, it's in the jury is well out. You've got some people who understand this intimately. Some people have no idea whatsoever of what you're talking about and being asked to make judgment on these sorts of issues. So I think it'll take a long while before we're really ready to have any sort of widespread attitude. I mean, if you think about what Europe came out of, the GDPR is great. It makes that attempt to put it in the control of individuals for their data. So it's a good first, first hit, but the speed at which that came out. And if you remember it, endlessly year after year, kept going around in circles and being refined. I sort of think we're going to have to move a bit quicker in truth. And we'll probably have to have regimes in the world or, or, or countries who are part of an agreement on how we allow data and identity to be developed. You might not want some countries, I'm not going to name them because I do work for some of them occasionally, although I do wonder why I do. But anyway, um, some countries you probably wouldn't want to be in the same network who are discussing how to how to manage identity. So it's a big political ball. It's going to be kicked around a long while. Well, I'm sure that will keep futurists in business for a long time to come then. So that's quite. Um, now, I, I also happen to know that there's a bit of a GDPR expert out there, Darren Ray. So i um, very happy to take a question from him. But by the way, everyone, um, let's get diverse questions in the Q&A. There's a little Q&A function there. If anyone wants to pop a question in, you are more than welcome and we'll try and cover them. Although um, I'd be surprised if we get to all of them. So to the results of our second poll, which are also resoundingly clear, I seem to remember, um, David Wordley, that that was 82% were in favor of actually introducing vaccine passports for international travel. So this group anyway has got a very clear perspective on it. Let, let's come back to the, the money question. And John Andrews points out in Bill Gates's book, The Road Ahead, he suggested that users should be paid for use of a person's data. First of all, might this be viable, um, Eric? And then secondly, David, um, what do you think about it? So Eric, can this be done? It can be done with some of these user-owned identity models that put kind of consent in the middle of it because consenting to that correlation is kind of exactly what you would need to be able to then have the traceability to, to send sort of payment back to the individual. And otherwise, I, I think it's a great idea in so much as that everyone has their data monetized right now for, for no real benefit out of their control. And putting the user in control of that opens up all those interesting channels. Um, yeah, medical research being being one of them, where uh, protecting personal private, uh, personal health information and the like is, is sort of a big issue. So there's not a lot of data sharing, but if there's data sharing with consent, um, it can feed into a lot of powerful analytics and models and sort of virtual studies and the like. You just need to put a person in the middle of it. And that's kind of a barrier, I suppose, in data sharing healthcare as a result there for good reasons. But still, if you take that model then and examine where um, you have no controls, that, that's exactly why it's a challenge to do this for other purposes, is that when you can freely move around consumer information without the user's consent, it's really sort of, um, well, you have to be restrictive on how you use it. People generally aren't. But those kind of controls are, I think, the path forward in terms of getting a person to benefit out of their own information. And, and the new services that can be created around that are kind of exciting. 
Well, I love the, the mention here from Stephen Cohn, who reminds us that Bill Gates didn't even mention the internet in that book that we've just referenced. So David, I'm gonna ask you a more difficult question. We're talking about things that we know about at the minute and we're getting a handle on them through all the great information that Eric's given it. What haven't we foreseen, David, to do with digital? Use that huge digital crystal ball of yours and tell us what might be out there that isn't even on our radar at the minute. Oh, um, that's a difficult question in a way. I know. <laughs> what, what really isn't on the agenda is doing things differently. The second phase hit of all new technologies. People sort of think they understand AI, but we're barely at the foothills of what AI can do. Affective computing, probably cognitive computing, behavioral analysis, all of these things ultimately can automate an awful lot of what we do in the world. So I'm a great believer in that we're at the digital age, but we're at the end of the digital age. We're at the beginning of the automated age. And that is a completely different, the intelligent era is probably a better way to put it. So if you haven't got the digital assets already established, and worked out what you're gonna do with them, then automating for the intelligent age is gonna be staggeringly hard. And that's the world we're heading for. The next phase is the intelligent age. So on our blockchain distributed world of, of, of disintermediated engagement, where middle players don't have a role unless they've got a specific value add, then, then we're gonna have a lot of P2P activity going on. And that'll, that'll play to Eric's point completely about security down at the heart of where it needs to be. But to your point about, you know, monetizing data, you know, the, the big row is yet to come is who owns it. I mean, at the moment, you've got a lot of companies who are completely based on owning data and having the right to do with the data, whatever they'd write. And they've got that often through the apps world of people agreeing with them. And the courts so far have upheld it. The European Union have recently upheld that because you said yes to sharing data, you have. But if you remember the insurance world, if I just barely mentioned that, their terms became so long winded that no one understood any of them. So they were forced to put in a little box on the front something called key facts. And they had to make that really easy to understand. So you could say yes or no. We're going to enter a world where permissiveness is going to be not taken for granted. I'm going to genuinely choose because I'm going to have choice, which I don't have right now. There's going to be a point where my data is a form of my living. So if I'm part of the world who can't be employed because we can't keep up with the change of jobs as we go through this intelligent era, and I'm not saying we won't have them, they will be there, but there might be a lag, but my data amassed and anonymized can be used by many companies and even used many thousands of times, I can start to earn a reasonable living. So I need to own it to give permission to people to use it. So what do the big uh, advertisers who sell my data because I use Facebook or Instagram, what do they do when there's a big row about who owns the data? And therefore I want something back in return for you having my information. So that is a massive row. And there is a massive row about permissiveness. And there was a massive row about intelligence, everything from automated cities to everything else. So that's three things that are gonna be absolutely enormous over the next five to 10 years. Great. Well, I mean, it's obviously going to be a very rowdy future then, which we all, we all look forward to. I'd like to thank Eddie for a comment here. Um, Eddie McCarter Mini, um, who points out that a, a UK business, yes, enabling individuals to monetize personal data was funded last week on Dragon's Den. So somebody is awake there. And Tommy McDonnell here has put a, a point saying that the public's usually behind thought leaders in terms of civil liberties safety above all else and references lockdown um is this kind of phenomenon pertinent to digital identity macro issues just briefly david what do you think about that one and then i want to come back eric because i'm going to ask you what's the role of blockchain if any in all of this so david well yeah of course it is it's i mean the, the minutiae of our detail about what we share and, and who we share it with is going to be the, the absolute essence of our existence. Um, I don't think lockdown has particularly changed very much, except uh, in terms of our living through lockdown. But what I am really excited about is it's changed our mind about what's possible. So even though we may not have enjoyed some of the experience of it, and of course we haven't, um, we've learned that with tech, we can still carry on working. With tech, we can continue to socialize. 
And, you know, quite honestly, even five or eight years ago, you couldn't have done this. The bandwidth would have been, bandwidth would have been so bad, it would have been absolutely impossible with dial-up, would have given up. And therefore, tech has had a, tech is one of the heroes of the pandemic. You know, it, it, if you recognise what made it work, what made us survive and continue and keep things bubbling along, it was tech. It was the Zooms of this world and the Teams and the other tools that allow us to engage. So, and we've woken up to that. And that means, well, hang on a minute, there's lots of things I can do differently. So we, we're in a very short bubble, and I believe it's only about a year long, in all truth, where there's going to be a conflict between those who want to take advantage of the changing attitude and those who want things to go back to the way they were. And we'll just hang on that one for a minute. So briefly, Eric, before we go to the next poll, blockchain, is the ubiquitous blockchain relevant to any of this? I think, uh, I mean, it's still a fairly nascent technology in terms of its development and deployment worldwide. Um, but exactly events like this and people getting more serious about digital and remote interactions, I think has been a big moment for the technology. Now that we're past all the hype cycle of crypto, ignoring that that's about to start again, um, it's allowed the technology to mature and find use cases where it can actually augment things. And I think the decentralized infrastructure is key to, to creating this whole user-owned spin in this user-owned uh, identity model, let's say, that can kind of move between organizations and jurisdictions and the like. Because by decentralizing things, that's how you kind of remove that centralized control. Um, removing that point of centralized control is then how you can actually get ownership back into an individual. And I think there's a lot of potential for the patterns there uh in, in in some form to form that future infrastructure that kind of then works around the world and is very sort of user-centric and beneficial and and certainly i would say with the pandemic times um it has 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 highlighted when we're doing things virtually the need to have a strong digital identity and be able to assert who you are who you're dealing with those sorts of things are now uh, more relevant than ever uh and it's certainly accelerated adoption and interest in a lot of these technologies as a result it's, it's, that, it's that difference between people previously wanting to digitize things, I guess, which is kind of how we got to where we are, digitizing offline, digitizing paper forms, those sort of things, and then moving into the next generation. And this, this is the phase of automation, moving and reinventing society to be truly digital, like digital first, I think is that real sort of evolution from it. And yeah, some of these foundational technologies like blockchain is, is going to be some of the, the guts and the back end to it, even if it's going to be so buried thankfully, that most people won't have to sort of overtly interact with it. Fine. It's just like a fancy digital comb, isn't it, really, blockchain? Anyway, leaving that aside, we'll come to our third poll, which is asking you, do you support the introduction of vaccine passports for access to restaurants, pubs, sporting or cultural events, the kind of the social stuff? Um, and while we are... Uh, doing that there's a question just popped in here anonymously but if we look at digital id how do you see that impacting passwords and password managers eric yeah um i mean technically speaking if you now have cryptographic keys um as sort of a, a first line authenticator it creates opportunities to get rid of passwords um it, it's a much more convenient authentication method, let's say, to prove that you own a cryptographic key and have the software take care of that with the same kind of security as you would have with the password. So I think we're moving towards a world where passwords aren't going to be necessary for kind of first level assurance into things. They'll probably be necessary, that or a PIN or a biometric for sort of like more serious multi-factor authentication scenarios. But I hope this is the start of the end of passwords anyways. The beginning of the end. I am my data, therefore I am. Right. Well, this poll, even more resounding support for the introduction of vaccine passports to get back to doing the social stuff uh, safely. So that there's a lot of support out there for doing this in the right kind of way. David, what's the question that you'd most like to answer that nobody's asked us yet? Okay. <clears throat> what is the most... Um... Well, I suppose is, uh, you know, are, are we prepared to embrace, it's our attitude again, it's not a technical issue, are we prepared to embrace the consequences of entering a new world where we address all the things we've talked about? So it's our attitude, you know, 
it's everything from sharing what you ate that morning to being a fashion um, follower. You know, all of the things we currently do now, you know, are we going to carry on doing the same things? Are we going to protect ourselves? Are we going to be part of the, the pre part of the solution rather than distributing data left, right and centre willy nilly? Are we going to have some control about how we manage this whole scenario? So attitudinally, we've got the issue. But corporately, if you ask me a question, are corporate going to take this up? There's going to be a, a mighty fight. So the question I'd like to ask is, are we likely to see this uh, in the next two or three years? And I'll probably say no on the basis. And I want the answer to be yes, by the way. But I would probably say no because there's too much vested interest in in organisations keeping control of data, keeping control of their versions of ID. If you think about that list you put up earlier, Eric, where you authenticate yourself using someone else's already proven logon, Facebook, Instagram, what people don't realise very often is that if you sign on with Facebook, you're probably sharing about 25, 30 pieces of information with that firm they didn't know before. So you are, you are accidentally, if not deliberately, but accidentally giving that company a lot of private information you didn't even get asked if you wanted to share. So, uh, for example, I always use a password and a, and a username, which drives me beyond nuts. I mean, it, it's crazy. But it, our, our awareness, our attitude, our teaching and training on this, they're all well out of kilter for the world we're about to enter. Well, I tell you what, we're going to have to ask Ioma to put on another webinar and come back and address some of those questions. Um, Eric, t tell us where where these digital credentials are already being used, in what kind of markets are corporates being used? Is it governments? Who's already doing it? Yeah, I would say a lot of the uptake right now is, is we're finding with governments and institutions who looking at, again, the real world identity models are strong issuers of things. So creators of driver's license, creators of passports, all of those sort of elements, those foundational documents are kind of leading this charge in terms of how can we actually digitize these things? Uh, and that's where, yeah, we're doing work sort of with governments in terms of exploring what can be done in replacing government documents with digital credentials and digital identity wallets, even just to access online services without a password, for instance. So those are some of the early models. Uh, the other good example of where this stuff is starting to be deployed is education. Uh, a lot more schools are kind of open in terms of recognizing that paper degrees aren't really student friendly moving to digital, moving to verifiable, moving to a lifelong credential that sits with the actual individual um, and that they have control and agency over just makes a lot more sense as we now look at the changing future of education where people are being retrained, reskilled all the time. There's lifelong learning. There's a need to manage these credentials far more than there was previously. And this tech is going kind of hand in hand with that to solve some of those problems. And then, yeah, the last one I would say is just recently um, the explosion of interest in and around COVID passports. Um, it's sort of a foundation for some of this new technology. Some governments are using it, some governments aren't using it, but it's still a good social trial in terms of how can people responsibly use something like a digital identity wallet and what are some of the social challenges involved in one, getting people to trust it, two, getting people to use it in society, and three, um, getting people to accept all of the technological assurances, all of the cryptography, all the underlying factors, people need to trust that this technology is doing what people say it's doing. So when we say it's privacy protecting, but you download a government wallet, a significant amount of people will still, better or worse, assume the government is tracking them or see that as sort of like government information because they don't get the subtlety of what's going on. And that I think is gonna be a big barrier uh, to the adoption of some of these things. And it gets back down to the social aspect and the education aspect of, just because you're empowered with a tool it doesn't fix the problem unless you understand the power of the tool and how to use it. Exactly. And of course, uh, and, and what it comes bundled with, in fact. So we were asked um, a kind of a, a quaint but very relevant question, too, which is, do I now exist forever? I know you've got this wonderful um, uh, background here, which might suggest I've passed into the ether already, but I promise you I'm a real person. Um, what happens when we die? Where do all our identities go? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of a very interesting question. Um, exactly because as we've entered the era of data, mass data, just over the last few decades, these giant treasure troves of information about ourselves are there, they're replicated, they're out there. 
right now we have no control over it. So I would say it's probably out there forever and we, we have no visibility into it. But this whole idea of a true digital identity, uh, all the claims and assertions attached to it, once we sort out the technological pieces of this model, that very much becomes relevant in terms of passing it through ages. How do you sort of delegate your digital identity on to your family once you're gone? How, if it's protecting assets, do you actually take all the assets attached to those digital identities and move them on? And it's, it's a very interesting angle in so much as that I think it's something we're going to have to do just because we're so good at sort of storing and persisting data. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a uncharted waters in that sense, but for sure something that's totally relevant. And I think the advantage or disadvantage of digital is yes, it can be permanent and live beyond its time. Right. Well, I mean, the, the time's come for us to, uh, to, to draw to a bit of a close. Well, let me, do, do you see it, David, just like that? We're ever going to be floating around in the ether like digital junk when we're gone? Well, unless we've, unless we've, um, we've um, left our passwords to our, our descendants with strict instructions on what to do with it, you're not going to get access to it, number one. Number two, a lot of it we don't own. It's out there being used by people anonymously or anonymized individually. It doesn't matter if they can try and contact a dead person self with it, serve them right. So I'm not I'm not bothered about that so much. But um, the real issue is when it's when it has value attached to it, then is that something that is taxable? Is that something that is 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 subject to inheritance and inheritance tax and tax and inheritance tax law? So it, it gets much more interesting when we start monetizing all of this data and start value, getting value away from the corporations. But it's interesting on a point you made a moment ago, I've got to just share this. About eight years ago, I was speaking at a dinner. I was the only speaker at a private dinner of the CIOs of Britain's 19 government departments. And these were the head guys and their goal was to identify the individual and share it between them. So this is So that was a moment where, sadly, David Smith has just frozen there when he was about to say something absolutely crucial. We'll see if he, if he comes back in the in the last two minutes. But if he doesn't, you certainly said us. You certainly we we missed that last bit, David. So they said that all well, the government thank you departments. They, heads, they all agreed that the number one goal uh, across all nineteen government departments to identify the individual and to share information across the departments. So the, the Nirvana, the goal of all government is to know everything about their citizens all the time. Now that can be used for good or can be used for ill. I mean, I'm not gonna debate that, uh, fairly interesting debate in itself, but that, that is a goal. And you know, corporations, if they no longer own data, who do we switch to the big companies in the future? Who are they? Rather than that, the, big, I think, the obvious big techs. Yeah, uh, that I think is a very good point at which to pause because uh, I would, before we uh, part, just like to thank you both, Eric and David, for some really, really insightful information, responses to all those questions. Definitely many of those questions still left open, but you've given us a good basis for thinking about them. I'd like to thank Ioma as well for the opportunity of our coming together to do this, David for his technical whiz. And I think that leaves us with just about 30 seconds in hand, David, for you to close down. And thanks to, to our audience. It's been great to have you here and I hope to see you on future occasions. Well, thank you very much for that, Christine. And thank you very much for your very insightful and competent handling of our uh, panelists. It's been a fascinating session uh, and I'm sure everyone involved has enjoyed it and got some value from it. Um, so it's now my, my pleasure just to bring this to a close and just to remind you uh, that we do have a feedback form to uh, complete um, at the end of this uh, session. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind uh, completing that uh, uh, well, we are going to be having our next webinar on Thursday, May the 20th at two o'clock. Uh, it will be on the subject of infrastructure, whole life, carbon cost. So thanks for participating again. Please log off now and complete our feedback survey. Thank you. <laughs>